Without any further ado, we'd like to welcome the cast of Imbible. Not so good, actually. At least, it wasn't so good for us. Noah was the first tiller of the soil. He planted a vineyard and drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. See, even back then, drunk equaled naked. But we'll get to that. Let's switch from Noah to Pasteur now, because we got a lot of science coming up, and if we stay on this path, it's going to take a Jewish carpenter to get us wine. I'm pretty sure that's not who they use in Napa Valley. Wine, as it turns out, is generally not made by messianic prophets, but by yeast. Yeast. A unicellular microorganism that's part of the fungi kingdom, and folks, it's everywhere, in the air, living on plants, it's even on your skin. But don't worry, it's mostly harmless. It can be a bit itchy if it gets in the wrong nooks and crannies. You can laugh at that, it's Friday. <laughs> Yeast is pretty single-minded as unicellular microscopic fungi go. Pretty much does one thing in life. It eats sugar and excretes alcohol and carbon dioxide. Now, the only thing it asks is that the sugar be dissolved in water. And that, really, is the beginning. Come back with me now to the days of the cavemen. <laughs> yeah, you think yeast leads a simple life? Pretty much all these guys did was eat, sleep, and try to not die. Because back then, the eating part took up all of your free time if you wanted to not die. <laughs> Meat was a real bitch. You had to hunt the mammoth while trying to not die. Kill the mammoth, definitely trying to not die. Drag the carcass back to your cave, still trying to not die. Clean it, cook it, all of which could easily use more calories than you got from the meal and was a little stressful. So mostly we ate plants, but even those could be a real pain in the grass to find till we learned to grow them where we wanted them to be. But eventually we did just that and the first plants we were able to farm were the most common. The grasses, things like wheat and rye and barley, the cereal grains. Once we had a handle on those, we could start making the staff of life bread. So back to our cavemen. And by the way, these were totally not cavemen. What? what? No, it just makes for a much cooler story. We're probably in the early Neolithic period, around 9500 BC. 
He is out gathering wheat to, sorry, more likely she. Thank you. Is out gathering wheat to make bread when suddenly a thunderstorm rolls in. Now remembering that her first husband once got caught in a thunderstorm, and that's what cleared the way for her second husband, she drops the half full basket of wheat and hightails it back to her cave. Now when the weather clears up, she goes back to gathering wheat and comes upon the basket she left in the grain, rain. Look at that. It's been a few days and the sugars in the grain have been dissolved by the rainwater that's collected in the vessel. Unbeknownst to our heroine, the yeast living on the wheat has been happily doing its thing. Grain looks different, kind of soupy and bubbly. Smells different too, sharp, but a bit sweet. So she tastes it. Not too bad, not great, but not bad. <laughs> yeah, then for some reason, she has the urge to take off her top. Woo. <laughs> and she realizes she's not wearing a top. What? Doesn't really know what a top is. Whatever. So it's all good, and off to the cave she goes with her growler of beer. Whoa. <laughs> because that's what she's just discovered. I'm awesome. <laughs> Cheers, my friends, and welcome to the Imbible at Google. Woo! <laughs> One, two, three. Beer, 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 tiddly beer, beer, beer. A long time ago, beer, beer, way back in history, beer, beer, when water beer, was the beer, only drink beer, as far as the eye could see, tiddly, tiddly, along beer, came a lass by the name of Carly Jane, beer, beer, and she beer, invented beer, a wonderful beer, drink, and she beer, made beer, it out of brain. Beer, oh, she beer, could have been a caveman, a goddess, or a queen. And to sing her praises, we are always keen. Look what she has done for us, she's filled us up with cheer. Oh, Lord bless Carly Jane, the lass who invented beer, 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 tiddly beer, beer, beer. The jury's pub and the stag, the Wexford Inn as well. One thing you can be sure of, it's Carly's drink they sell. So you lads and lasses at 11 o'clock refrain. For five short seconds, remember Carly Jane. One, two, three, four, five. She could have been a cave woman, a goddess, or a queen. And to sing the praises, we are always keen. Look what she has done for us, she spilled us up with cheer. Oh Lord bless Carly Jane, the last one invented. Beer, 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 tiddly beer, beer, beer. A bushel of malt, a barrel of hops, dirt around the tree. The type of irritation to make your only tiddly tiddly beer. Forty pints of whopper, they will keep away the quacks. It's only if it's a penny of drink and one in six in tax. Everybody sing with us! One, two, three, four, five! She could have been a cave woman, a goddess, or a queen. And to sing her praises, we are always keen. Look what she has done for us, she's filled us up with cheer. A Lord bless Carly Jane, the last one invented beer, 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 tiddly beer, beer, beer. A Lord bless Carly Jane! Woo! <laughs> Good job, everyone. Nicely done. I love that song. What was I talking about? Oh. <laughs> Cereal grains plus water plus yeast equals beer. But you don't need to limit yourself to cereal grains. Grape juice, which already has water in it, plus yeast equals? Wine. Yeah, just shout them right out <laughs> if you know the answers, folks. All right, what if we start with the juice of palm fruits like apples or pears? Anyone? Cider? Yeah, you can Google these. <laughs> <laughs> Cider, very good. I'm gonna make it a little harder. How about if we dissolve honey in water and add yeast? Yeah, there we go. All right. I like it when the crowd gets mead. Let's keep an eye on this and see what happens. So to generalize my original statement, sugar plus water plus yeast equals alcohol. Or as I like to write it, ethyl alcohol equals sugar plus water plus yeast. And I call this the alcohol sugar equivalence formula. And it demonstrates the same relationship between sugar and alcohol that Einstein's equivalence formula demonstrates between energy, I am serious. <laughs> no, look, think about it. Einstein's formula shows that mass can be converted into energy, right? The more mass you start with, the more energy you get. Well, my equation shows that sugar can be converted into ethyl alcohol. The more sugar you start with, 
the more alcohol you get. I would argue that my equation has had a greater impact on human history. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the discovery of fermentation, this process of converting sugar into alcohol using yeast, has been more important to the evolution of our species than the discovery of fire. I would be wrong. <laughs> like, way wrong. But I would certainly say that. Maybe after a few drinks, I will. Here's why. Alcohol is toxic. But you knew that. It's right in the word. In toxicated, <laughs> yes. It's toxic to us in surprisingly small doses. What is the legal blood alcohol limit to drive in New York State? I'm not going to use the joke again. <laughs> Who knows? 0.08. There you go. Good. If you didn't know that, when we're done with the show, then I need you to download an app called Uber. <laughs> All right, look at this number, folks. Look. That is not 8%, right? It's not 8 tenths of a percent. It's 8 one hundredths of a percent. That's one part in every 1,250. If 8 one hundredths of 1% 1 of your blood is ethyl alcohol, you are too in toxicated, toxicated to legally drive. At just over one half of 1%, you go into a coma and die. So, yeah, alcohol is toxic, fun fact. But here's the coolness it's not just toxic to us, it's toxic to lots of other things as well, including some pretty nasty stuff like bacteria and fungi. Plus, it can inactivate viruses, which is a nice bonus. And if alcohol is toxic to our big asses, in quantities as small as one half of 1%, how much alcohol do you think it takes to kill a teensy, weensy little bacterium? Not too much is the correct answer. And this is why I say that the discovery of fermentation and our resulting ability to produce this incredibly effective disinfecting agent incredibly easily from incredibly common ingredients has quite literally allowed the human race to survive attacks that would have otherwise neatly killed us off. And ultimately, go on to invent cool stuff like iPhones and twerking. <laughs> anyway, it didn't take too long for our cave woman to figure this out. When she brought that first growler back to her people and they started drinking the beer inside, they noticed a few things. First, the people who drank the bubbly grain juice tended to not die as much as the people who just drank water. Remember, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters. OK, ever hear, don't drink the water? <laughs> yeah, folks, we have a rover on Mars right now looking for life, right? But is it actually looking for life like little green Martians? No, what's it looking for? Water, very good. And what did we just find? Water. Now, why are we so excited? Because water is the key to life. Tons of things live in water. Disease-causing agents love water. And we can't live without it. So let's fast forward a bit from our clever cavewoman and drop in on her progeny about 10,000 years later. People have gotten really good at getting plants to grow where they want. They've gotten somewhat less good, but still better at not dying. In large part because they've been gathering together in bigger and bigger groups centered around these farms for a few thousand years now. We're in the midst of an agricultural revolution with its resulting rise in cities. Taxi. <laughs> and twerking is looming ever closer on the horizon. Now cities have lots of upside, right? There's uh, easy access to food, protection from outside invaders, truly outstanding off-Broadway musical comedies with cocktails. <laughs> they also pose some problems. Where do we usually build cities? Hint, we have one on each side of us at this very moment. Rivers, very good. Can't live without water, right? But we also use these rivers for lots of other things, like washing, transportation, waste disposal. 
trapping people in New Jersey if they don't endorse you in an election. <laughs> Very versatile, these rivers. Down by the old mill stream, where I first met you, with your eyes of blue. Dressed in gingham, too. It was then, it was then I, knew, I knew that you loved, that you loved me, me true. You were 16, sweet 16, my village queen. Village by the old mill stream. By the old, by the old stream. Mill stream. I thank you very much. And it's a great system. Clean water flows up to the city. The inhabitants use it to drink, cook, clean, fill up bongs. Then they throw the waste out into the street where it runs back down to the river and is carried away. Perfection. Unless you live in a city downstream from, say, London. In which case, your H2O is a veritable petri dish of living goo, courtesy of the folks upstream. So as fast as we were filling up these cities, we were filling up the cemeteries even faster. Now, a lot of people think that song was written about the plague. Oh. <laughs> yeah the rosy red welt with a circle around it caused by the bacteria. Oh. Stuffing your pockets with flowers to combat the stench of decay. Gross. And burning the dead to ashes. Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right, well, those lyrics were likely added later. It's pretty clear that life wasn't quite as safe as houses around this time. But take some of that pestilence-laden river water. Add a little of our bubbly grain juice, suddenly all those nasty pathogens die off. So you're a cave woman's, I don't know, great, 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 great granddaughter. Still trying really hard to not die. Don't drink the water. Drink the beer. You guys got some beer coming, right? Yes. <laughs> There it is. What kind is it? Oh, it's, it's right there. But our keg has arrived. Oh, great. <laughs> Fantastic. Guys? Spiritus. Spiritus. Sanctus. By the Middle Ages, people were drinking low alcohol, small ale as an everyday drink. Now, the small ale was packed with vitamins and minerals. I mean, it was really liquid bread, after all. And at about 2 or 3% ABV, or alcohol by volume, had just enough ethanol to kill off any bad stuff. It's what everybody drank, including pregnant women and children. Because think about it. Would you rather your kid catch a little buzz or die of cholera. I mean, I guess it depends on your kid. <laughs> Look, small ale was just part of a balanced breakfast, folks. Laborers would drink gallons of the stuff every day while they were sweating away their electrolytes. It was the original sports drink, really. So score one for ethanol. 
which as I mentioned is the alcohol we've been talking about. Ethanol or ethyl alcohol is the type of alcohol we drink. Now there's lots of other alcohols. There's methanol, uh, isopropyl alcohol, butanol, amyl alcohol. But the only one we drink is ethyl alcohol. And yes, it's exactly the same as the ethanol you put in your car. So what is this stuff that you have been pouring into your stomachs and gas tanks? Sweet ethanol. Sweet ethanol. My ethanol. My ethanol. <laughs> At night, dear heart. At night, dear heart. For you I call. For you I call. In all my dreams, in all my dreams, your fair face beams, your fair face beams, you're the flower of my heart, sweet ethanol, sweet Thank you. Okay, so ethanol is a volatile, flammable, colorless liquid with the structural formula CH3CH2OH. Now, best known as the type of alcohol found in alcoholic beverages, it is also used in thermometers as a solvent and as a fuel. Ethyl alcohol can cause alcohol intoxication when consumed. It is one of the oldest recreational drugs still used by humans with significant psychoactive effects. In common usage, it is often referred to simply as alcohol, liquor, or hooch. Yeah, no, thank you, Wikipedia. Okay, so ethanol is volatile. That means it boils at a low temperature. You need to remember that. Flammable, it burns, <laughs> like in your car engine. And of course, significant psychoactive effects, which you will be feeling in just a few minutes. So let's talk about that. I said when our cave people uh, started drinking the bubbly grain juice, they noticed a few things. Well, in addition to not dying as much, another thing they noticed was that the people who drank the juice threw way better parties than everybody else. Woo -hoo! Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was dancing. Oh, and singing karaoke. Ah! And a lot of times, you'd wake up next to somebody you didn't even know the day before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At first I was afraid. I was a bed driven. Yes. I kept thinking I could never live without you. Bye. Bye. I'm going to make you smile. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> don't, don't go away from me. But then I spent so many nights thinking, huh? Is this me? Yes, you know it. <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> you have great hair. <laughs> cool. We'll see you later. That I grew on oh, it. There we go. One guy. <laughs> you win. I'll give you all another chance. That I grew. Oh my God. Strong. All right, one more, guys. <laughs> that I grew. There it is. And I learned how to get along and say I'm back from outer space. I just walked in a bad new hair with that thing. That's Nicole David Day, ladies and gentlemen. That's our director right there. So not only are these grain drinkers living longer, they're living way cooler. This really gets our ancestors' attention. Pretty soon they become more interested in the dancing and karaoke part of the beer than in the not dying as much part. They start to wonder if there's a way to get just the fun part out. That dancing and karaoke spirit of the drink. Right around 900 AD, a Persian 
uh, physician slash philosopher slash chemist slash alchemist by the name of Muhammad Ibn Zakaria al Razi, or Razis, as he was known to his peeps. Peeps! <laughs> identifies this essence, which the International Conference on Chemical Nomenclature officially names ethanol about a millennium later in Geneva, Switzerland. But folks, some of us still just call it spirits. So now the problem becomes how to get those spirits out of beer. Because as cool as beer and other fermented drinks like wine, cider, and mead are, they're still mostly water. And that's just gonna slow things down if you're trying to get a dance party started. Yeah, dance party! No, Al <laughs> Alec. Woo! Al Alec. Oh, come on dude, now. <laughs> oh, not we go. Woo! <laughs> Woo! Dude, Alec! Woo! Alec. Yeah! <laughs> no, he's very excited. <laughs> We're not twerking yet. Oh, all right. I'll be back. Good. Good. All right, so, um, so alcohol is toxic to microorganisms, right? But what makes alcohol? This was like five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, very good, yeast. And what is yeast? A microorganism. There's the rub. Now, as any of you who've kept uh, fish or have hamsters <laughs> or children know, most things don't thrive in their own excrement. Ditto yeast. See how our yeast is Whoa. Nicole, nicely done. I made a mess. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it up for yeast, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> You're not going to hear that at Hamilton. <laughs> All right. That's not bad. For that was like, what, maybe 10 minutes of fermentation? But as soon as the alcohol builds up to a certain level, usually not much more than about 15% the yeast will either go dormant or die. No more alcohol after that. Now, this is why most fermented drinks top out at about 17% ABV, right? Beer is generally about 3 to 5% ABV. Cider hovers around 6%. Apples have more sugar than grain, so cider ends up with more alcohol than beer. And wine, which usually starts with the most sugar, usually ends up at between 10 and 15%. Now, any idea what the ABV of a spirit like uh, vodka is? 40, very good. So my question is, how do we go from beer with an alcohol content of 5% to vodka with an alcohol content of 40 if we know that yeast is going to give up the ghost at 15%? Say it? Distillation, very good. So to find out how we came up with that neat trick, you're going to have to come see the Imbibal. At New World Stages, uh, we are playing. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll give you the schedule later. Let's give it up for the cast, guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you. So this show, um, I saw it recently in its entirety. Fantastic show. Thank you. Um, and I've had to try to, as I'm telling people to go see it, the way I've described it is um, the show itself is a cocktail, uh, two parts world history, one part anthropology, uh, a dash of chemistry with a, a liberal garnish of barbershop quartet, <laughs> <Yes>. um, <laughs> which is like, we, sounds delicious. That. Yes, it is. very accurate. Um, how did you come up with the idea for this? Where did it start? So like all good cocktails, the origin story is a, a little muddy and very collaborative. Um, the, 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 I guess the, the, the genesis of the show started with uh, lectures and seminars that I was giving uh, within the beverage industry um, for, I, I teach at the Institute of Culinary Education. I'm the director of beverage studies there. And also I used to do a lot of work with the liquor brands. Um, I was a national brand ambassador um, and a lot of educational work. So I would give sort of very high level talks on spirits and cocktails, history, science, trying to engage consumers and also bartenders. Um, and my degree is actually mechanical engineering. So I would get pretty geeky in these presentations. But I'd always, always been running theater companies as well. So um, I was running a company with Nicole, which is the company that we're currently uh, Broadway Theater Studio, which produces the Imbibal. Um, and we decided that we would incorporate some elements of theater. 
sketches and comedy and stuff like that um, into the presentations. And people love them because in these presentations, you also always get cocktails. You're not going to go to a <laughs> seminar hosted by Bacardi unless you're getting a Bacardi drink. So the standard was always three drinks within like a couple hours that you get. Um, and after the uh, one of these called the science of mixology, um, someone came up to me afterwards and said, you know, you live in New York. If you did this exact presentation downtown on a Friday night, I would go see it. So fast forward five years <laughs> or something like that. Um, Nicole, who's an incredibly talented writer, uh, had been writing some, uh, some plays and w was entering a show in the New York Fringe Festival. 2014, and I said, you know, I have this idea. Would you mind if I also entered a show? And she was like, yeah, we could, you know, one of them, neither of them are going to get in, but, you know, whatever, it'll double our chances. Well, they both got in, and we ended up producing two full-length shows in the Fringe Festival uh, at one time, um, and the Imbibal got a lot of press because we served drinks during the show. That had never been done at Fringe, um, so we got encored, and then we opened off Broadway shortly after that. But the, the, it started, like I said, as lectures, the idea to bring in sort of a Greek chorus and um, introduce music and comedy and sketches and costumes and, and all of this, um, the majority of that is, is due to Nicole. She came on board as a director and said, you know, I have this vision. What if you are the bartender and there's a staff behind you? that sort of all you know, are analogous to restaurant servers, and they can help propel the story. And what was going to originally just be a one-man show turned into this um, full musical comedy. Fantastic. So. And this, like, the a cappella harmonies that you all are doing are amazing. Like, it's not anything else that, Thank certainly you. not anything else that's happening on Broadway right now <laughs> or, or near it. Um, did that come easily? I mean, this, is this your training? Well, I, I studied theater and music in college, but um, one of my favorite experiences in college, I was in an a cappella group, and people would say that we were uh, a drinking group with a singing problem. So I spent a lot of time during my college training actually in an a cappella group, um, and often, you know, alcohol was involved, so this was a perfect fit for me right out of college. <laughs> I just love booze. No, I mean, I, uh, I also went to school for musical theater. Um, I never really had a cappella training, but like, I just, I don't know, I, I've always been very good at just listening and, and hearing, picking up other parts and whatnot. And I mean, I'm fortunate, again, I have talented coworkers that just yes. mesh with me very well. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a unique talent and actually hard to find. You know, we've been casting this show now for three years and we have four versions of the show. So, um, we have a rum show, a brunch show, and a Christmas show. And to find casts that are able to do this, because most musical theater kids right out of college are trained to just stand and sing their solo with an orchestra behind them. And that's not, that's not this at all. You have to be able to hold your own part while people right next to you are singing something completely different. And there's no orchestra to help you. Right. Which has got to save money, but be frustrating. <laughs> that. Yeah. Both of those things. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you talk about like these skills to have, in addition to being an a cappella group who is also doing comedy. Um, you're also going around serving drinks with like trays in hand. Yeah. <laughs> so that opening number we sang, we actually served the audience the first drink during it. Uh, we get that, and then hilariously, people see us as servers then, and we're singing in their faces, and they're trying to talk to us. Right. Like, oh, okay, can I actually get water? <laughs> or uh, what's in this? And I'm like, I am singing a song right now. <laughs> <laughs> do they ever tip? Yes. yes. Oh, <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> So wow, you really it's, this business it's model a good is deal. fantastic. It's a good deal. But to Nicole's point, we actually put in all of our casting calls um, that we're looking for actors with serving experience because you know not only are we asking people to you remember bits and and do costume changes and sing, but they got to do it while they're carrying trays and serving drinks, and that's something it's difficult to kind of just pick up off the street. Um, so luckily, many actors also have restaurant experience. Oh. <laughs> but actually, Kate I mean, didn't. Um, she was not. just so talented, and we loved her. And she has great people skills and wonderful at improv, which is really helpful. Our show is right in your face. But Kate has a great story about the, sh the night before her first well, show. Yeah, I, I am not a server. I've had like one serving job, and I was like rubbish at it. I, I was not good. <laughs> and so, of course, I got hired for this, and I was so nervous the night before my first show 
that like I remember like I was up at like 2 a.m. and I found something to like make a tray with and I was like serving drinks and like going over my part to my cats like in my room <laughs> just like bye like trying to like make sure like please don't spill this during the show but like literally like that was the most nervous I was and I, even to this day like I, I I'm a little better at it now but I still have that moment of like Oh shit! Before I go onwards, oh sorry, I didn't. Oh sorry, I don't. Sorry. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Oh, great. Unless everyone's gonna see that. But yeah, like just drinking. There's like a hot moment. The only I'm drinker just like, on the right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but it's it's better now, obviously. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, and it's not just that. Like, oh, you know, you crap on a Coors Light and hand it out. Like, you're making real cocktails. Like the uh, when I was there, you make spoiler alert. This an old fashioned. Um, that was amazing. This was like caramel, caramel sugar with apples, and it was it was incredible. It was one of the best drinks I've ever had. And I understand that was just the drink that night when I was there. How often does it change, and who decides? So uh, again, collaborative. Um, the old fashioned we use because it's a very interesting story behind the old fashioned that we actually the drinks that we serve aren't random; they're all incorporated into the script. So as we're teaching you about the history of a drink, we will serve it to you. Um, and the old fashioned is more of a template than a recipe. So we change it up every month or two. And I actually we have a stage manager who's been with us for about three years now, um, and we kind of have given her free reign to come up with the flavors for the old fashioned. So if you like the cat Caramel apple. Yeah. I will tell Kim that you like the caramel <laughs> apple. Yeah. Uh, before that, we had uh, what did we strawberry. have? Strawberry, strawberry and creamsicle. Basil. Basil. Yeah. yeah, and we've done some really, really cool stuff. So there's incentive to see the show multiple there times. There is, <laughs> yes, um, there is, absolutely. And, and we also, figure, I mean, if we're going to talk about, you know, I've been in the bartending world for, you know, since like 1911 or something now, <laughs> and so um, you know, we kind of feel an obligation that if we're going to put ourselves out there as uh, in a position where we're going to teach you about spirits and cocktails, we should put our money where our mouth is and give you some pretty darn good cocktails. Um, so we try and do that. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> it's also got to make for some interesting audiences. Uh, oh, yes. yes. What's, yes. What, what, is, what is the best and or worst story you've got uh, from? Who wants to tell it? Uh, you've got it. You've got a really no, good one. No, it's I Nicole's mean. got it. Yeah. yeah, Nicole's got it. Thank probably. you. Thank you. Oh, Thank here we you. Go. So, Cheers. Woo, BMP. MPP. <laughs> The okay. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, so we um, we had all our, our audiences range in age. You know, we have the 21 year olds who want to come drink, and then we have the older people that really enjoy the history, and they're honestly my favorite. But then sometimes we get these like middle aged women, and then <laughs> they, which is why she's telling the story because yeah. I couldn't. Tell. <laughs> <laughs> like you know. Like late 50s and just out for a good time and very interesting people and we had five of them on stage. Um, because they, they, we should probably. Oh, thank you. Alan. Yes. So yeah, it, the it's the like stage. The yeah, the, this isn't a standard theater set. Your set is a bar. We're all sitting at the bar with you. Okay. So um, this is this. We were at a different space for two years, and now this past year we've been at New World, where you saw the show. Um, and our premium seats are at the bar. Like, literally, you are on bar stools at the bar. Um, we had a small stage at the other show that was, like, across from the bar, and our premium sat on the stage. And so these this group of five women were sitting on the stage, and Anthony starts talking about the yeast. And the one woman goes, Kathy has a yeast infection right now! <laughs> Stop the show, <laughs> if you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. To Kathy. To, to Kathy. Kathy. Yes, to never Kathy. forget. Uh, never yeah. forget, Kathy. <laughs> now, um, this is not your first interaction with Google. You've, no. uh, I've, I've, I learned this um, kind of incidentally. Uh, we have some things that we've been doing with the Slow Food Program and with um, Farm to Table projects. And apparently, you're involved there too. Yeah. So we're going to be doing, I think, with with uh, Vanessa Googler, group. who's off stage. Yeah, we're going to be doing a cocktail event that is going to be 
sustainable cocktails and farms table and like all kinds of really good stuff. Um, and then I also did uh, a talk at Google a few years back um, on the history of whiskey. Uh, I think it's called The Wonderful World of Whiskey or something like that, um, where we uh, actually talked for about an hour and a half just on whiskey and the science and history and cultural significance of whiskey, and it was amazing. Um, you guys are awesome. Yes, you. We, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about the sweet. Yeah, <laughs> you very. Wow. I love it. I'm sorry, are you drinking out of a stein right now? Is that like a, a metal stein? Oh okay. my gosh. That's no, that's serious. Right from the animals. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. That's amazing. I love. Yeah, that. right. We actually set up the still and <laughs> still uh, moonshine right on stage, and so. Yeah, um, I, I, I just, you guys are awesome. It's a great, great place. So. Wow, thank you. And that's the other thing is that, so you're, you're serving drinks and you're harmonizing and you're dancing and you're hitting all your marks and you're giving this incredibly engaging lecture and you're setting up science experiments on the fly. Has that, I, has that always gone perfectly every show? I am not doing that. They are doing that. 90% of the time. 90%, yeah, we, we, we do a pretty good job. I mean, the most that'll go wrong is like every now and then, like, we'll have like a cylinder that like starts to like, kind of like leaning tower of Pisa, and then we just have to like go and straighten it and adjust it during like intermission, but we've never really had any. Yeah, I mean, knock on wood. No, yeah. We've <laughs> also like, yeah, we've learned enough about how to make it work that if it happens to malfunction in some way, We've we've always been able to fix it, you know, um, within the show and, and make it work. Um, so so yeah, I mean, it's it's just gotten to the point where we're just used to to how it's done. Yeah, the science here works pretty much the same way. Like Eighty percent of the time, it works every time. Uh, now, now that you took that ball pit out, I don't know. I'm just. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but to their credit, I mean, you you're, you make a great point. We are we actually distill moonshine live on stage for real, from beer in real time, and then we um, you know, prove that it's ethanol the whole bit. Um, and the show's been, we're probably coming up on 600 performances now, I gotta believe. That's 600 distillation runs that it's, that this cast has, which is probably more than some micro distilleries at this point. Like, I'm not even kidding. Yeah. Like, it's a lot of booze <laughs> that they make, and it's got to go perfectly every single night, and that doesn't happen in commercial distilleries. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, I mean, I, I don't think I expressed to you guys enough how impressed I am with the way that you do that, because there is no safety net, there are no tricks, um, they actually take beer and turn it into moonshine every single night in front of the audience, and it's just, it's fantastic, and I just sit there and sing, so. <laughs> Huzzah, drink yeah, to that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Before we, we wrap, do we have questions from the audience? Anything about the show? <laughs> Tonight. Tonight. Tonight, eight o'clock. <laughs> so what's the schedule? Uh, so we run Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays at 8 p.m., Saturdays at 5 and 8 p.m. That's this show, um, The Imbible Spirit of History of Drinking. The Imbible Day Drinking, run, it's a, the history of brunch and brunch cocktails with a build-your-own-bloody Mary bar. Um, also tells the story of coffee, and we make Irish coffees, and the story of champagne, and we make Bellinis. Um, that runs Tuesdays. Tuesdays, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> Saturdays right. at 2 and Sundays at 3. And then um, in November, start, we'll start with Christmas. Our yeah, so we have a Christmas show, um, which is called the Imbible Christmas Carol Cocktails, uh, that is basically a retelling of a Christmas carol. The hangovers of, of Christmas past. <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah, so it actually picks really. up at the end of the book, and Scrooge is all happy about Christmas. He decides he wants to throw a big Christmas party, but he realizes he doesn't know how to make drinks because he's been Scrooge his whole life. So he calls all the holiday spirits back. Spirits. Spirits. See what uh, we did there? And they go out for another night, but this time they teach him about cocktails past, present, and future. And so we teach you like the history of eggnog and why we drink that, and we actually serve a precursor to eggnog and uh, go through all that. And the last drink, uh, we actually use liquid nitrogen live on stage and titrate um, alcoholic cream into Dippin' Dots live on stage. We make alcoholic <laughs> Dippin' Dots like live for like 70 people. So these guys are crazy, man. <laughs> they do some really amazing stuff. The Rockettes got nothing on you guys. No. <laughs> no, and we can kick our faces. Yeah, we yeah. also do kick lines. We yes. also do kick lines. Just give me a yeah, so you can check out imbible.nyc and hopefully we'll be able to get a, a, a Google deal out um, to you guys too for discounts and we have some cards there for you guys to use discount codes too. Yeah. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Yes. Yes. Ian Bible. Awesome. Cheers. 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 Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.